But yeah, it's important that we also get to learn about the other area that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we want these funds to accelerate us into a greener future, but we also want these funds to be as democratic as possible. Uh, what we are witnessing right now is that it is mostly organizations, corporations with deep pockets that are able to uh, navigate the complexity of these funds through uh, consultancy groups. Uh, we're seeing that they are uh, the ones most likely to get uh, to grab the money, uh, even if it brings our economy. And that is something that worries us. Um, and that's why we asked Brooke to tell us more about it uh, and the work he does in Brussels on this topic. The floor is yours, Brooke. Thank you, Virginia. And good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you to Marcus for his, his uh, excellent first presentation, which I'll try to follow up on. So this is such a big question. It is really hard to know where to start. I'm probably going to jump about a bit from EU level to national to local and back again. I'll try and hold to the, to the guiding principle, which is indeed, how do we take those unprecedentedly large amounts of money and match them up with genuinely useful green projects. Now, uh, Virginia, you just now mentioned that bigger industries, bigger corporations have better access to uh, consultants to help them access the funds. And that's completely true. When the commission first started talking about recovery funds, what I was hearing within my company was that there was this race across Europe to try and book up uh, McKinsey, one of the big top name consultancies, to, to try and carry out work to justify that this or that company justifies getting recovery funds from the EU. McKinsey at the time couldn't be hired for the next two to three months. There was such a, a rush on, on, on their services. So we do have this challenge that uh, the bigger the company, in a way, the easier it is to get the EU recovery funds. And there is one reason for this, one, I think, simple reason for this, it is very hard to spend the recovery funds. It is very hard to take 750 billion euros of recovery funds and spend them by the end of 2026. It's easier to take the money and to allocate it to really big projects like motorways, like bridges, uh, like port installations, like airports, than it is to try and take 700, uh, 750 billion and to match it up with 100 or 200 million houses across Europe and renovate them properly, or to create 100 million small-scale renewable energy installations. That, that is hard. That is what is really difficult. And that is what I want to try and talk a little about a, a bit about with you this, this, this evening. So um, this, this line of work goes by the extremely boring name of technical assistance. And Technical assistance consists of trying to train and support people in, in ministries, in, in cities, in local authorities, so that they can get better at scaling up the size of renovation programs, scaling up the size of renewable energy programs, and to turn, for example, uh, a 100 million euro a year renovation program into a 1 billion euro a year renovation program. And what we're seeing at the moment is that even people at the top of the commission who have a huge personal stake in making the green deal and the green recovery work don't really understand exactly what sort of technical assistance resources they themselves are, are sitting on. And one reason for this is that there is a bewildering amount of technical assistance resources out there. Uh, one of the most useful things that maybe Virginia and Marcus and I could do after this call is to share with you the different agencies at EU level who provide support to develop green investment projects and to, to try and give you an idea of when are the deadlines for applying, what are the eligibility conditions for applying, uh, whether you, you can apply as, as an NGO, as a small uh, local authority association, whether you have to be a city, whether you can apply as an SME. It is a maze and to navigate that maze, you need guides. And this is the whole principle of, of, of technical assistance. Now, I want to try and talk a little bit about what it is like from the perspective of being 
on the ground and looking up towards Brussels and trying to figure out how you can access the money. I'm going to try and give a few examples which can try and illustrate both the opportunities and, and the challenges. So um, somebody mentioned Latvia earlier. I think it was Marcus when you were talking about the low level of support in Latvia for, for building renovation. One of the challenges there is that local authorities in Latvia don't like building renovation. The reason they don't like building renovation is that they run district heating projects. In other words, the more district heating they, they sell, uh, the better they are doing as a local authority. Therefore, anything which reduces demand for district heating is seen as, as a bad thing. But in next door uh, Lithuania or, or in Poland, uh, it's a very different approach. There is also district heating there in, in places, but local authorities, when they help people apply for subsidies for building renovation, uh, they get a bonus. They get 100 zloty in Poland, which is about 22 euros for every household which signs up for subsidies. They get the, something similar in, in Lithuania. What, what One lesson which we take from this is the need to create an incentive system for local authorities, for cities, to want to help people like us to be able to access those recovery funds and spend them on the 37%, to spend them on renovation, to spend them on renewables, to spend them on uh, electric vehicles. Um, there are other examples of how this doesn't work well. Uh, I've been looking at a renovation scheme in Ireland, which is hosted by the Irish Post Office called Anne Post. And if you go onto the website, you'll see this extremely simple appealing all in one place uh, site where you can figure out uh, the subsidies you're eligible for. You can get in touch with, with workforce, qualified workforce. You can get an idea of the timing, the depth of renovation you need to carry out. All that looks great. Um, but when you scroll down, you see the interest rates which are being charged. And these interest rates range from 5% to 12% for loans of between 5,000 euros and 20,000 euros. That's five to 12%. These EU funds are being raised at the moment on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange with a negative interest rate for seven year bonds and an interest rate of 0.134% for 30 year bonds. We're seeing this colossal mismatch between the exceptionally cheap money and the interest rates which are being charged for this building renovation scheme in Ireland. And this is EU money, which is being rooted into this Irish post office scheme and then lent on at uh, usurious interest rates uh, to people. Now, this is the sort of thing which gives renovation and green investments in general a very, very bad name. And it highlights the fact that just as we have very laudable efforts to take EU funds and turn them into good green investment opportunities. We also have people who are taking advantage of very cheap EU money to make very high profit margins when they're lending it on. So what we're doing in Ireland to try and address this is, well, speak to the Green Energy Minister, Eamon Ryan. We're speaking to NGOs who are based there. What we need to do, as well as ensuring that there is the easiest possible access to EU funds, we also have to police the way that the EU funds are being used. We don't want to see these 750 billion EU funds merely being uh, diverted into, uh, let's say, less than, than, than uh, attractive uh, interest. Now, there's another, there's another big question, which is um, a billion euros is a vast amount of money. 750 billion euros is unimaginably bigger. Um, how can citizens actually access that money? I mean, how does it really work? Um, one, one example of how it can work, and I'm gonna give the example of my, my, my local city, Brussels. Um, what, what often happens, Brussels is divided into different neighborhoods. The one I live in is called uh, Ixel. And Ixel doesn't actually have any full-time staff whose, whose job it is to try and find sources of EU money. But the next door commune does have people working full time to access EU funding. They've got two people working full time. The result is that this next door commune, which is called Skarbek, is vastly better at getting EU funds than Excel is. Now, one very practical example of how EU technical assistance works 
is that there is something called the European City Facility, which offers grants of 60,000 euros to local municipalities, which is just about enough money to hire one or two people, depending on the country, of course, to be able to work full time in filling in applications for other sources of funding. In other words, it acts as a sort of trampoline, which would allow a local authority to be able to get into the ball game of applying for EU recovery funds. Now, Marcus was saying earlier that really the, the, the quality or not of the way the EU recovery funds uh, are spent, really that is a battleground which is being fought over at, at member state level. And it, it's really up to, uh, up to all of us, up to NGOs, up to progressive companies, up to individuals to try and lobby our member states to use funds more effectively. And that, that, is, that, is, that is completely true, but we've, we've got to be as tactical as possible in the way that we are lobbying these member states. Now, the commission has two months in, under which to review the recovery plans which member states have sent in, two months. One thing which is going to be exceptionally important during those two months is when the commission sends feedback back to the countries, um, they have to assess whether or not they feel that countries have the logistical resources in place to be able to take the money and to spend it on green investment projects. So something which I do see that the We Move organization could do during those next two months is target very specifically the people in the commission who we know will be drafting the assessments of member states' recovery plans and really urge them to take a very hard practical look as to whether these technical assistance parameters, this support for ministries, for cities, for local authorities, for NGOs, for other organizations, to be able to spend the money effectively is being respected or not. This is something which we can really do over the next two months. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'm just seeing if I can uh, drop in a few other quick points. Please do. Okay. So, I, I think the, the other, maybe the, the other really big thing is that these, these sources of, of EU technical assistance, this, this means of matching up the money with the projects, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's something which is considered extremely boring. There is this temptation at EU level, at national level to try and take as much of the money as possible and spend it on projects. And there is a bit of a neglect of the understanding that in order to spend money on projects, you have to invest money in distribution channels. And this really, I think, is, is, is something that the more that we can be communicating about the different sources of EU technical assistance, the different existing sources of national assistance, um, the better we are going to be able to be to match up funding with projects. Now, just to try and give a, a longer term perspective here, um, we, are, we are in a situation with an, a very large amount of money being earmarked between now and the end of 2026. But what we do not want is a boom and bust situation where very large amounts of money are spent over the next five years, and then we fall off a cliff face afterwards. So one more reason for building up these distribution networks is that if you have people in place in ministries, in cities who are working to build up projects over the next five to six years, these people are going to have a very strong vested interest to ensure that new sources of funding are being located to carry on investments after that period. Because really the name of the game here is not to take a large amount of money and spend it in the next five to six years and recover well. The name of the game is to sustain those very high levels of investment all the way out to 2030, all the way out to 2050 and meet the EU's net zero by 2050 objective. So when we are talking about putting in place logistical distribution channels, it's really not just for the recovery funds, it is all about the next decades. So it is not something which is going to take place immediately over the next six months to a year to build up this, this capacity at national level. It's something which could well take two or three years, but once it is in place, this is something which is going to enable us to really carry out the energy transition well beyond 2026 and to look for other sources of funding during that time as well. So it is really not this recover, as Virginia said at the beginning, it is 
laying the apparatus, creating the network so that we can really have a sustained transformation all the way out for the next three decades. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Virginia, and turn to questions. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is time for questions. Um, you could put them on the chat. And uh, in fact, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, just say them out loud, uh, that's also fine. Um, I'm just looking through the, some of them now. I will read them out and try to answer them. Uh, okay, so somebody asked for the website, presumably for this Irish renovation scheme. Yes, of course, I will share it. Um, somebody else is saying that uh, this is highway robbery, but what does one expect from neoliberal economies? Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that one. Um, I first heard about this Irish scheme from the European Investment Bank, which was very happy about the extent to which uh, the, the, the Irish scheme is trying to simplify the process of applying for renovation funds. And they themselves were quite shocked when they scrolled down and, and saw the interest rates. But the basic model is fantastic. And I'll briefly explain the, the model. The scheme in Ireland is roughly 75 million euros in total, of which 50 million euros is being provided by European investment bank loans. These loans come with an interest rate of 2%. It's extremely cheap. Uh, the European Commission is also providing something called the guarantee fund of 6 million euros. The, the principle of this guarantee fund is that it covers more or less the expected default rate of the renovation scheme. In other words, what they've done under this approach is engineer away the risk. The commission is providing a grant of 6 million euros to cover the potential risk of defaults. Um, the EIB is providing cheap loans. The remaining 25 million euros are being provided from local sources, but really there's not much risk to this lending process because as I said, there is the 6 million euro guarantee fund to cover defaults. The model itself is, is therefore, I think quite brilliant. It's working in other countries as well. Um, Lithuania, for example, Poland, these are other examples. Um, models like this, uh, they have to be better promoted by the banks who are in touch with them. We've got to the, go to the point when, when we are going into a bank asking for a mortgage, or if we already have a mortgage with a bank, that that bank sees a very strong interest if we are first taking out a mortgage, suggesting that we take uh, financing on top for renovation, or if we have an existing mortgage with them, uh, the bank calling us up and saying, would you like to take out uh, extra funding on top to carry out a deep renovation? And therefore using banks as a way to link up EU recovery funds with renovation projects. That in itself is a, a very good model. The question is, uh, can we popularize it enough so that it is sufficiently well known and distributed? And at the same time, can we police it enough to ensure that uh, uh, very high interest rates are not being charged? I'll move to next questions. Um, there's a question about whether the EU is committed to inclusive growth policies. Uh, what is happening is that there is inclusive growth for the wrong parties. Um, well, I think Marcus said this well, uh, this green deal, this green recovery, some people are saying, well, isn't this just for you know, climate and energy policies? But the fact is we're going for such high levels of emission cuts at the moment, net zero by 2050, which as Marcus can tell us is, is a bit too late. We should be aiming earlier, 2040 or 2045, as some EU countries are doing. We're aiming at 55% greenhouse gas cuts for 2030, which is again on the weak side, but still. Um, this has got to the point, the ambition levels have got to the point where it is completely all encompassing. You cannot now have economic uh, projections, economic plans, and I say this as a company representative, uh, without completely following the legislative framework which is being set by the European Green Deal. So it's certainly not perfect growth, but it is making it very hard not to have green growth at the moment. Um, I'm looking at a final question, which is, um, we need to see that such schemes are a systematic part of our economical practice and not just limited to the EU. Um, again, this is a very good 
point. What we are seeing at the moment, often across Europe with, with technical assistance, with EU funds, is a bit of a re repeat of the oil spot theory. We're, we're testing little pilot schemes here and there, and we're hoping that they're going to merge together and build up to something bigger. Um, I was speaking to somebody from the Commission's Regional Affairs Department yesterday. That's the Department of the Commission, which spends, arranges for the EU seven-year budget to, to be spent. And, and what they're saying is that um, we, we, we have to we have to radically increase the capacity of member states to absorb funds. They gave the example of Italy, which over the next six years is planning to spend four times as much money on climate and energy as they did over the past 10 years. So a massive increase in budgets. Uh, Italy is interesting because for building renovation, for example, they have something called a 110% super bonus scheme. In other words, if you renovate your home, you don't get all the money back, you get 110% of the money back. So it is extremely attractive. Uh, the challenge there is that it's just extremely hard to fill in the paperwork and apply for support for the scheme. Uh, so systems like this, which are designed to be attractive, are sometimes failing because it's still too complex for people to apply for the support. Another thing which we're seeing with the case in Italy, which at the end of the day is operating at a very large scale, is that this is somewhere where EU recovery funds can quickly be rooted into green projects. I said at the beginning that one of the challenges is that people want to spend the money quickly. Governments want to quickly allocate funds so they can say we've got a high absorption rate, quote unquote. Uh, and the easiest way to do this is to spend it on big infrastructure projects like motorways, for example. Well, Italy is this interesting case where we have a roughly 10 billion euro building renovation scheme, which has this big merit of being large enough to be able to quickly absorb a very high share of Italy's share of the EU recovery funds. So mostly across Europe, we're currently operating at a small scale, a small distribution process, not all that much money going to not that many green projects. What we're now doing is getting much more money than before, but unless the distribution network to spend that money is scaled up in proportion to the size of the funds which are available, except in cases like Italy, for example, where there are already big spending plans, it's, it's going to be like trying to pour lots of water through a very small funnel. It's just going to take too long. It's going to drip through. It's not going to happen fast enough. So without the infrastructure, um, without the people, the brains in place to help turn good but small green investment projects into much bigger ones, um, we will fail with this recovery plan. We'll fail to spend it on, on green investment needs. Hence the importance for these uh, as I put it at the beginning, boring but extremely important technical assistance measures to be able to scale up rapidly and to deliver results rapidly. Can I say something? Hello. Hello. Please go ahead. Yeah. No. What is happening is is really that uh, most uh, renovations are are done by big uh, companies uh, which own a lot or many many. Um, lending uh, apartments uh, to um, to uh, lenders of, of those units yeah and when they renovate uh, they, they build up assets the, the the units become more and more expensive and in many cases they get uh, rented out of their, their units yeah because they cannot pay for it anymore so assets are not built up on in a widespread population but uh, just uh, build up uh, on company assets. So here is a really a policy which goes in the wrong direction. I'm, I'm fully understanding we need both. We need renovation, and but we, we miss out on asset building in, in a widespread population. And uh, here, especially now where we have practically zero interest, uh, we be missing out a huge opportunity to build up those assets uh, for those people. Uh, we have that in Germany, we have unpayable uh, um, units already, uh, uh, and this is also enforced by uh, all these renovation schemes. 
and uh, the effect is uh, that uh, basically people get rented out of their their units. No? So the units become so expensive that they cannot pay for it anymore. So a reverse effect is is happening. The people get uh, they cannot afford these units anymore, and uh, they get poorer and poorer. So it's it's a reverse uh, thing, and not really healthy for our economy. Uh, we had. Uh, Many decades ago, we had a social uh, committed market economy um, uh, postulated, uh, but uh, it seems right now we have a total different uh, direction and development. And that in face of zero, zero interest rates or negative interest rates. So the, the, the state, uh, the, the government fails really to uh, unleash a private, uh, not a privatization policy, but asset building policy for people. And, and uh, that should go along, along with uh, renovation policies uh, towards transition to uh, renewable energy and, and less energy demand in those units. So what's your take on that? Sure, it's a good question. This is something called gentrification where yeah. uh, you have this traditional kind of tenant landlord divide where the yes, landlords yes, absolutely. Has... So we have a reverse de de development, totally reverse. Yeah. Well, the alternative, of course, is that those tenants continue to live in very poor quality homes, which is not acceptable either. So we have to find yes. a solution in which landlords <laughs> are getting support if they need it to be able to carry out the renovations and that the rent still stay affordable just, for the tenants. Just... Now, they're... Just Sorry. look what happened in Berlin. Berlin uh, sold 10 years ago, 40,000 units to private companies, to private uh, developers, 40,000 units. They could uh, unleash an, an, an owner's uh, own program together and combined with renovation um, activation. We had uh, low interest rates at that time as well. So oh. I, I think in many other places happens the same thing. Let me just try and outline a, a possible solution to that, um, which I certainly don't think is perfect, but is perhaps fairer. Um, this is something which uh, we're working on at the moment in Brussels. It's called Minimum Energy Performance Standards, and it builds on an idea from, from the Netherlands. The, the principle here, and it's already happening in, 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 in the Dutch case, is that rental property has to meet a minimum energy class, a minimum efficiency by a certain date. Now in the Netherlands, all rental property has to be something called energy class B, which is pretty good, by next year. Now, at the same time as uh, owners of apartments have to bring the buildings up to that B class standard, they are getting a lot of cheap finance from various uh, sources and a lot of technical assistance to actually help them carry out the work. Now. The result of this is that possibly in some cases rents are going up, but the value of the property, the quality of living in the property is also going up substantially. So there is obviously always a risk of, of abuse, but at the same time, uh, an approach where uh, landlords are being given a stick and a carrot does on the whole seem to be leading to a kind of fair outcome for all. Not perfect, but fair. After all, if one's building is considerably better than before, it is only fair that the rent goes up. The question is, how much does it go up? Does it go up with an acceptable bounce? If so, fine, fair. Does it go up by unacceptable levels? No, we're in a situation like the Irish renovation case, which I outlined. 